Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Rev Left Radio. On today's episode, I have on the show my good friend and co-host of Gorilla History, Adnan Hussein. And today we're going to be talking about the relationship between Islam and Marxism. Um, Longtime listeners of the show will know this is something I'm interested in. I have many episodes discussing uh, variations of the revolutionary left and different religious traditions. I myself have hopefully done some worthwhile work on the on the Buddhist front and um, dialectical materialism. We've had on Christians. We've done an episode with Adnan on St. Francis, which was very well received and still one of those episodes I'm, I'm very proud of. Um, and so I want to continue doing this. I don't see it happen a lot on the Marxist left. And I think I find these conversations fruitful and interesting, even if you walk away disagreeing with some core arguments made by me or my guests. I think it's a worthwhile endeavor. So Adnan, for the two or three people out there who don't know who you are, you just want to give a quick introduction to, to who you are? Sure. And it's great to be back in conversation with you on Rev Left. Of course, we enjoy our conversations on guerrilla history, but I, I really also like these opportunities to really think about religion, spirituality, and the Marxist and uh, communist traditions. Um, I am a professor of uh, medieval Mediterranean and Islamic world history at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, and I also direct the School of Religion. So obviously I'm interested in interreligious uh, relations historically. And... Um, yeah, that's that's really the kind of stuff I work on, Muslim-Christian-Jewish interactions in the medieval world. Cool, yeah. Could not ask for a better guest, um, even if I didn't know you personally, which I do, so that makes you even a better guest. Um, but let, <laughs> let's go ahead and, and get into it. The place I want to start is sort of your personal experiences. So, I mean, I, I know you, you came from an Islamic family, but maybe you can talk about your experiences with both Islam, how you got into it. I mean, often, even as children, we, we take up the religion that we're born into, but as adults, we, we actually analyze it and, and come to a new, more mature relationship with it. So perhaps you could touch on that. And then your your relationship and how you got into to Marxism politically. Yeah, okay. That's a great question. Uh, uh, it's maybe a bit of a mystery to me uh, to really figure out because both parts feel very natural uh, to me and relate well to one another. Um, but if I think about it, uh, my experience, of course, as you've already alluded, um, you know, with Islam comes from my family background. Um, my parents were from different parts of the Middle East and have language in common, really, besides English, and they're from different cultures. So in some ways, Islam was the common ground and was what was most emphasized as the core of our uh, identity. So I grew up in a religious household, but uh, I think the particular feature that's been important um, influential for me, in addition to broadly just kind of regular Sunni practice, is um, the tradition of Sufism or the you know Islamic spiritual orientation. And we've talked about Sufism um, as on Rev Left before. Uh, um, so I came from this particular sort of orientation. And I think I saw in my mother's practice a real concern for service to others and, and as part of orientation, how what she understood and Islam to mean was standing for justice and serving others. And those two core principles are things I really see as rooted in uh, Islam and in particular in the spiritual orientation and when it comes to Marxism, um, a friend of mine once said, I think that, you know, if, if Marx hadn't uh, developed his ideas, we would have had to have invented it. You know, I really feel that there's something to that, that quite apart from the specifics of his theory and analysis of capitalism, his particular theory of history, his arguments in favor of dialectical materialism, the fundamental problem of social justice, of uh, ethics, of um, responding to that feeling, equality among humanity, and seeking a just, fairer, equitable world is just something that's a core ethical commitment that regardless of whether you want to think of it as Marxism or other um, ideologies of liberation. There's just some um, 
you know, there, there's just something fundamentally true, it seems to me, and has always seemed to me, about uh, the need to confront exploitation, unfairness, um, oppression. Um, and of, I think also, you know, I, I, I grew up with a real, despite living in the United States, because of having roots and connections to other parts of the world, I had an empathy for the Islamic world, the Middle East. And I grew up um, during a period where uh, there was a lot of war and conflict in the Middle East, usually, um, you know, because of the United States proxy wars or direct interventions. I'll never forget what it was like being in college and university and the first Gulf War uh, beginning. Um, and then later, of course, um, you know, the global war on terrorism when I was older. But I've always identified with maybe even to some extent with the Iranian revolution, um, with attempts to overthrow these corrupt Western proxy governments on behalf of a better future for the people, just as a broad, um, you know, sense. I think also identification with the uh, cause of the liberation of Palestine. So I had an anti-imperialist uh, orientation, I think, politically, even before it was formulated in precise ways through dialectical materialism and the kind of analysis about capitalism that you receive from Marxism. It's it's something about core ethics of justice, core ethics of sovereignty and self-determination of peoples and anti-imperialism, um, and identifying with struggles of the global South, even while, um, you know, I was living in the imperial core. So I think there were some natural interrelationships um, between these two things and the formation of my own political consciousness. And you know, at some point in college, I did read, well, actually, even in high school, I read some Marx. I read some other anti-imperialist thinkers. Um, and I also started to get interested myself in whether there was a way to bring together uh, my religious ethics and practices with these political, broader political commitments. And I will say that I think during this period, uh, you know, modernist Islam um, really reframed itself as a kind of ideology that competed with other ideologies on some level. So this idea that uh, religion and spiritual concerns were not separated from social and political commitments is something that was very much a part of Muslim culture during this period, except that really pretty frequently it was seen as an alternative to secular ideologies, including Marxism. So for me, it was more about the fact that um, I was convinced, however, by, uh, you know, by a sense that there really was a lot of common ground at the core ethical dimensions um, and analysis Um you know, in Islam and in Marxism, that they just felt like a natural fit for me as I grew increasingly in my political consciousness. Mm. Yeah, that's incredibly interesting. Your your point about justice and service being, you know, inherent to your understanding um, and experience of, of Islam and that leading you in the direction of, at the very least, you know, left-wing revolutionary sort of ideologies. I know I, I think a lot of people out there have similar impulses, right? There's like this in, inside tendency, whether it's religious, secular, anything else, toward, you know, more equality, you know, you're sort of inherently repulsed by injustice, um, whether that's nature, nurture, or some mixture thereof, and you go around looking for things to make sense of the world around you, and one of the things that, you know, why Marxism won out for me was not only because of its historical efficacy compared with other um, ideologies, but that I felt, once I really started getting into it, that it was 
it was different than mere political ideologies. You know, you could say, right. I'm a liberal, I'm a fascist, I'm an anarchist, and that's all political ideology. What Marxism offers is this incredibly robust analysis and methodology, this way of understanding history, this framework of thinking that just seems superior to mere ideologies. It has its ideological aspects, of course, but it seemed much more rooted in you know, an, an actual understanding of the world rather than just, you know, here are my values, here's my beliefs, this is what I call myself, this is what I identify politically. It, it gave you more than just that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, one thing you mentioned also that I should have mentioned earlier myself is just that understanding of history. So, you know, I do a guerrilla, you know, co-host guerrilla history with you, and I'm very committed as myself, a historian, but I think as I began to study history and I was interested in the early history of Islam in medieval societies and in modern history, I think that was one other thing that attracted me to Marxism was that there was a theory and understanding of history, that uh, understanding historical consciousness and material forces as being intimately interconnected and unfolding over time that gave me some sense of tools um, as I became more formally engaged in, under, in understanding Marxist thought and communist, you know, theories and writings. I mean, you know, even just reading um, Lenin's What is to be Done, as I did uh, maybe in my second year of, of college, uh, there was anti-imperialist history, you know, that was... Um, larger than just the particulars that you might observe um, in my knowledge and awareness of what was taking place in the Middle East to be able to sense that there was a broader critical uh, orientation and movement um, that explained how similar things that had happened to you know, the Middle East in these imperial invasions and earlier colonial uh, eras that this happened in other parts of the world as well. And that there was an analysis that brought that together in history. That was very important to me as as well as somebody who was engaged with and interested in, in, in history. So, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's interesting. I, I grew up sort of... Um, sort of the religious equivalent of apolitical, meaning it wasn't consciously secular. It wasn't agnostic or atheist. It was just none of that stuff was ever mentioned on, you know, my mom and dad were divorced. So my, I had a stepdad. I had multiple stepmothers over the years, but nobody I came across had any interest in religion. This was never brought up, nor was it anti-religious. Right. And then in my early teens, 12, 13, 14 years old, I decided by myself that I wanted to become a Christian. Um, I asked my parents to get me into a Christian school to get me baptized. And they were like kind of taken aback, like, what the hell? But okay, you know, they did it. Um, and then I came in my late teens to bounce out of that pretty hard and then embrace new atheism. And then my late teens, early 20s, you know, I was sort of socially, I would be like a progressive. I, I flirted with democratic socialism. I even flirted with anarchism a little bit in line with my atheism. But it was, it's very interesting because what ended up displacing my new atheism was Marxism, particularly around the issues of the war on terror. Because my progressive politics, I mean, I saw straight up, you know, the, the negative aspect of the war, the nationalist fervor that it, you know, created here in the United States, how people who stood up and spoke against the war were just absolutely torn to shreds by the mainstream media and the mainstream culture in our society. And the new atheist explanation for why the the nine eleven happened and the subsequent war happened, it would it, you know Sam Harris's classic thing of it's the ideas that are inherent in Islam. Islam is just an inherently barbaric right. religion, and that's why they do things like nine eleven. <laughs> and I, that just and, and then I had this increasing encroachment of these Marxist ideas coming in, and it's like whoa, well, you know, it came at direct odds with that hyper idealist interpretation of the war on terror. You started learning the history of imperialism in the Middle East. I read Osama bin Laden's um, reasoning for why he did 9-11, and it had nothing to do with the inherent ideas in Islam. Talking about like bombing Lebanon and how he saw little kids get murdered mm -hmm. and how the, you know, the imperial beast must be fought at all costs. And I was like, oh. And it was, so it was actually this deeper analysis that Marxism offered 
that not only transcended my other left wing politics at the time, but also displaced my new atheism utterly. And I and since that point, because I saw that huge hole in the in the middle of new atheism, I quickly became a critic of the thing that I, I was an advocate for before. So it's again that depth of analysis that Marxism offered overcame. What I, what I see as, you know, a youthful and perhaps useful but ultimately limited uh, experience with, like, hardcore atheism. So I always found that interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is, uh, you know, those those remarks are really uh, resonant with me because um, I think the way these things came together for me in part was because Islam was so identified for me with resistance against colonialism, against imperialism, against uh, the emerging neoliberal order that already, you know, in the 90s, you could see was um, just oppressing people under a new frame through the extension of global capitalism and the liberalizing of, you know, uh, these economies in places like the Middle East that had devastating consequences for people. And, um, you know, that the form in which resistance was increasingly taking, take, you know, taking was uh, through religious movements that provided the social services um, that confronted the idea of, um, of uh, you know, capitalist and Western global hegemony, uh, and because uh, there were these uh, periods of military intervention. And I have to say, I think the cause of Palestine was something that ran so strongly in my consciousness as bringing together commitments um, in the Middle East for social justice. Um, And I know, of course, you know that there there were uncomfortable overlaps here between religion um and um marxism or left secular uh, ideologies but for me i just didn't see for me the cosmology you know cosmological kinds of claims were never the important thing about religion i mean there's a spiritual dim- and there's an ethical and social dimension for me. And so some of the other things that are about belief systems and their elaboration, theology, um, even though I study theology in, as a you know scholar of Muslim intellectual history, um, it just seemed to me that the core ethical dimensions uh, don't conflict with one another. Uh, it, there are other superstructural elements that may conflict in terms of ideology, but what's important about, for me, what was important about being a Muslim and practicing Islam uh, melded well with these universal commitments to justice and um, uh, an egalitarian sort of world. So, um I always thought that, uh, and I think we talked a little bit about this when we were um, discussing on guerrilla history, uh, religion and Marxism more broadly, is just that a lot of misemphasis on what's really significant or important in each of these traditions tends to pit them against one another when actually I think there's a lot of overlaps. And if you focus and concentrate on those, as I have Typically, I think there's a way in which they're compatible and almost, I wouldn't say necessary for one another, but there's a mutual reinforcing where the spiritual and and ethical dimensions of religion just recharge your energy and commitment through through dialectical material analysis. Um, You you know, it's just at that emotional level, you still need... uh, um, some sense of wholeness in your experience to continue to engage in not only the analysis, but the activism uh, to be a committed revolutionary. And uh, so I've not seen them. I know that on an intellectual level, people can say, oh, there's these lines of disagreement and incompatibility, but those are not what's most important for me about Marxism or Islam, I guess, is, is kind of how I felt it yeah. in my life. 
No, I love that, and I think we absolutely um, have always sort of found common ground on, on that part in particular, because when I was a new atheist, what I was going against in religion was precisely these metaphysical claims and these yes. supernatural ontologies and epistemologies that I felt from like a rational perspective, you know, these are not good, and look at the harm that they cause. But as I matured, I realized that the religious impulse within me at least, had absolutely nothing to do. It's still to this day, like, about claims, like, is there a God? Is there a heaven or a hell? These are, I'm completely agnostic on all of that. It's the spiritual pursuit that I can do in this life, the ethics, the the deepening of my own existence that these practices offer that really, you know, lured me into getting very interested in this stuff. So I, I absolutely um, agree with you about that. But let me go ahead and move in that direction with regards to Islam. And I'm wondering about... Um, some core concepts within Islam um, that might be utilized or brought into relation with Marxism. For example, when I did Dialectics and Liberation, that speech I gave at ASU, I talked about how Mm -hmm. both Marxism and Buddhism share a dialectical apprehension of the world. You know, liberation theology takes core concepts within Christianity and says, you know, service, taking care of the poor, we're all equal under God. These are ideas that we can put into social and political practice as well. They're not just religious ideas in our heads. Um, So I'm wondering in that same vein, are there any core concepts within Islam that that you see in particular synergy with um, core concepts within Marxism or just revolutionary left-wing politics in particular? Yeah, um, I think there are several core ideas um, and core values that you find in um, the Quran. For um, well, I guess I would start with one thing, which is um, this idea that uh, the good, enjoining the good and um, forbidding or rejecting the evil, which is this injunction that you find in the Quran, it's always about improving the world and, um, you know, trying to live ethically in society. And that's another component is that all the ethics, so much of the ethics in Islam are, are social ethics. So in the Meccan period, uh, that is the chapters and verses that are from the Meccan period, um, they're divided between you know, those revelations that are, are attributed to um, the early career of Muhammad and the later career in Medina. So his hometown of Mecca, these things, these um, kind of verses really deal with these universal sorts of themes about oppression, um, about unfairness in society and about the need for social solidarity and generosity in your communities in order for um, the the whole society to function properly, and that was apparently breaking down in that in that era. And so you have this concern for the poor, the vulnerable in society that they need to be protected, and that there's a special kind of duty that everyone has to express that solidarity for those who are suffering. And I guess another one of the key themes is that worse than almost anything other than sort of theological you know, issues of associating partnership with God, right? Because it's a very monotheistic kind of theology. Um, But apart from those, the social theology um, is really about how oppression is the worst thing and injustice is the worst thing uh, to experience and to suffer. And um, so those are kind of core um, kind of problems, it seems to me, where you know, it really does reflect uh, what Marx said about religion and how it was the cry of the oppressed, right? It is essentially, you know, uh, what the early verses of the Quran are voicing is this um, dissatisfaction with tolerating inequality, oppression, and injustice, Um in one's society. And it's not just a kind of spiritual problem, but it's about the way in which um, these ethical and moral commitments have to be made social. And and so that, I think, is really important. So you find that there are a lot of, um, you know, uh, resources in some ways in Quranic verses about things like uh, 
and in, in early Islamic uh, legal traditions about, and the hadith that is the sayings uh, that are a kind of secondary source for Islamic ethics and law that come from the example that uh, that has been preserved and recorded and transmitted about Muhammad's, um, you know, activities and teachings and, and statements and so on, that you find that there is like, uh, you know, a real concern about uh, debt and the fact that debt gives people power, that it's an oppressive power and so that you should try and avoid debt and the abuses that come in finance I mean, what would capitalism be without, you know, uh, what would finance uh, capitalism be without, you know, uh, interest loans and credit, right? I mean, this was all as anathema in Islamic social ethics was the idea that you would uh, um, need for, uh, you know, for, for, you know, credit, right? So... There, there's a real antipathy to the way in which money can operate to exacerbate power differences um, and undermine a an ideal or ethic of egalitarianism, even though, of course, hierarchy is understood as having some natural basis. But there's fundamentally a spiritual uh, egalitarianism that is ideally is translated into... Um, social equality as well, that, that I find that that is a very important core um, value. And you see that even in the kind of basic practices. So, you know, one of the five pillars uh, um, of Islam in terms of its religious practice is um, this charitable tithing. Well, it shouldn't even be called a charitable tithing because it's like a requirement uh, um, that you have to, um, you know, give a certain amount of your savings that you've held for a year um, to pious purposes of support for others, like, you know, relief and assistance for the poor, supporting students, uh, people who are travelers or, you know, on journeys. Like, oh, there's a variety of categories of people, i.e. those in vulnerable situations, um, to support and help them. And my analysis of this always was that it's clearly an anti-hoarding because it's only what is, you know, what is sort of subject to this levy is um, resources that have been kept back in liquid form and are not circulating or being productive in, you know, benefiting society through some kind of enterprise or investment. So it's this kind of ethic that hoarding is terrible. And there are a lot of hadith, for example, about how hoarding, um, you know, is one of the great evils, you know, so it's attacking this kind of inequity uh, of a social fix of egalitarianism. Um, and another kind of component that I found very interesting is this kind of sense of the natural world as belonging to everyone. Well, in fact, actually, the idea really that's important is that there's a huge critique of, of, of wealth. I mean, that's, that's interesting and unique. It's not quite like, you know, the, the Christian view that uh, a rich man, you know, can't get into heaven or it's harder to get into heaven than, you know, a uh, camel through the eye of the needle sort of um, ethic. It, the idea is that it's okay for for generation of productive activity that has benefits in society. That in itself is not the problem. The problem is ownership over it and imagining that you are the owner and that you have abilities you know, to the rest of society. Um that was one kind of component that I felt was, you know, relevant to the ethics of um, social egalitarianism and, in, in, you know, secular leftist views, but also this idea that the natural world um, really, you know, can't be portioned out in terms of property, like, like you know, all the resources um, that like water has to be shared. And of course, in the Middle East, water was a very scarce resource that had to be distributed very carefully um, in, in, in society for productive agriculture. But there was also this idea that the mineral, that what's you know, under the earth belongs to the entire people or population. And when I think about that, I used to think about this in terms of um, 
the one key natural resource uh, for which the Middle East is known, oil, is that clearly an Islamic ethics would have meant that these resources should be shared universally and not um, appropriated by, um, you know, these corrupt Gulf monarchies and so on. So there were a lot of like elements that I found in Un, usually underemphasized uh, aspects of Islam um, in the modern world that I saw as blowing very naturally into um, an anti-capitalist sort of perspective. And so even though Islam is known as a religion that um, you know seems to facilitate certain kinds of commerce, uh, the ethics around it seem to me much closer to an anti-capitalist uh, sort of ideal. And so there were a lot of resources I felt um, when I studied the Quran and the Hadith um, for thinking about the way in which the contemporary world was organized as being out of uh, kilter with these ethics of justice and egalitarianism and you know, it was part of my earliest critique of uh, capitalism and the injustices of the modern world were thinking through what I thought genuine Islamic ethics were when I studied uh, the Quran and um, the Prophet Muhammad's example. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's really, really interesting. Uh, I love all those points you made, particularly the one where in Islamic history, of course, water is this valuable commodity or this valuable thing, this natural resource. And the idea that any one person should own it or have property or be able to hoard it and sell it to others is just anathema. Um, I just, yeah. yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. So that's philosophically, you can see, as with other religions, although the concepts are different, there is clearly stuff here that you can work with to make a progressive left wing or even Marxist critique of capitalism using the language and concepts of the dominant religion in and of itself. But I'm wondering about how the history of these move uh, of Islam and Marxism have actually played out. So I know that's a that's a book in and of itself, perhaps several books. Um, but can you kind of talk about how you know historically these uh, the Marxist movements have done in Islamic cultures and sort of how that relationship has actually played out in real historical events? Sure. Yeah. Um, I did also want to say uh, that I neglected to mention that there are a lot of very interesting other economically oriented hadith reports about you know teachings of Muhammad that um, are worth mentioning. I haven't you know covered the full gamut by any means, but one thing I do also remember that I did want to mention is that there are a number about workers and about how if you've hired somebody, you should pay them before their sweat is you know like immediately like you should make sure you pay them. And there are a lot of injunctions about paying them fairly, um, you know, what they deserve so that live. And that there are a lot of condemnations for the miser who doesn't reward people for the benefit of their work. And so that also flowed very well into thinking about workers, labor organizing, and things like that, is just to have a strong ethics where... Um, uh, you know, there's a value of 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 labor that labor needs to be you know valued and and treated treated properly. So, but yeah, so this you know, despite the fact that there's been all these um, what I would say you know uh, very substantial resources for critiquing uh, capitalism and certain more destructive ideas about property and natural resources and all of that uh, in the modern world. Very frequently, um, these ideological systems or Islam as it becomes turned into an ideology through modernist, reformist thought and movements, um, often pitted these uh, sort of traditions against one another because of these theological questions, um, you know, and differences and because of the nature of secular, you know, left ideologies and their hostility to historic religious institutions um, as they emerge and develop in Europe, right? I mean, they, they do have their particular history. When these were imported into the Middle East and Islamic world, there's some ways in which 
the incompatibilities of their development exacerbated tensions that I think in some ways don't really need to be there. But nonetheless, there were some, you know, uh, figures who were very, uh, you know, interested in rethinking uh, Islam through the lens of these liberatory um, ideologies, um, including Marxism. So already by the late 19th and early 20th centuries, um, you have traditions like Jadidism in Central Asia, 19th and early 20th century movements for Islamic reform um, that uh, became relevant um, when um, you know the Russian Revolution takes place. Uh, and similar kinds of left, uh, maybe we might think of them more initially as bourgeois revolutions, but constitutional reforms that took place in uh, places like uh, the Ottoman Empire and Turkey and in Iran in the early part of the 20th century that started bringing um, kind of secular political ideologies and Islamic reformist thought more together, particularly through anti-imperial and anti-colonial organizing. So there's you know some very interesting figures from these late 19th and early 20th century periods across the Middle East, somebody like Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, um, who was actually from Iran, I believe, um, who was a big influence on Muslim reformers in other par parts of the Middle East, including Egypt and people like Muhammad Abdu. Um, but I think the more close connection with Marxism, you can see in somebody like Sultan Mir Galiev, who um, was, um, he, he's a very kind of interesting um, figure, uh, who is from uh, uh, Bashkiria um, in what is today Russia near Kazan. And, you know, he was uh, a kind of reformist um, thinker and Marxist uh, who really thought that, um, you know, this, this revolution would allow um, colonized Muslim people to really articulate uh, a new, new political consciousness for liberation. And so um, casted uh, kind of uh, sense of the oppressing versus the oppressed nations, he thought all colonized Muslim peoples are proletarian peoples, right? So he saw this kind of sense of uh, kinship between, you know, Marxist uh, and that of ocean and um, a possible project of decolonization and anti Muslim peoples. And so he was a very strong supporter of, uh, you know, of the uh, Bolshevik uh, revolution and thought that this revolutionary energy should be carried forward to, you know, the rest of Asia and Africa um, to throw off colonialism. And so, um, you know, he was a Tatar, um, you know, a Tatar Muslim who was a committed uh, Marxist and thought that there were symmetries between uh, between these these, uh, you know, political ideologies. And so he's been a kind of an interesting and influential figure uh, for some of his writings and ideologies, but also as an activist um, that uh, is worth kind of pointing out as, as, a, as a key and interesting figure. Um, also, I find um, that somebody like uh, Ali Shariati, who was um, uh, an Iranian sociologist um, who, uh, you know, was born in the 30s, I believe, and died before the Islamic uh, Revolution in Iran uh, in 1977, but is often thought to have been one of the ideological supports for this anti-imperialist and socialistically oriented uh, form of Islamic resistance to the Shah of, of Iran um, that played a role to some extent um, in at least the early ideological foundations of the Islamic revolution. Of course, it's gone in you know many different directions, and you wouldn't say that he was more important, for example, than somebody like um, you know 
uh, Khomeini, but um, he's somebody who had uh, a whole set of very interesting writings through the lens of uh, the characteristics and qualities of of social justice that he thought were you know endemic and uh, fundamental and foundational to Islam, but that you know hadn't been fully uh, realized and interpreted in light of some modern knowledge uh, about you know society, um, history, economics, and so on. And so he endeavored in many ways to reinterpret what we could call a Muslim liberation theology. And I think he might have been, you know, somewhat influenced by um, some of those um, important thinkers like Gustavo Gutierrez and Leonardo Boff, who, you know, were important in Christian or Catholic liberation theology. But I think he imagined seeing something uh, similar. And what I found very fascinating and interesting about his ideas as well is that he had some that were very specific to she that developed out of the particular uh, history um, that uh, for the uh, for, for the she uh, how certain uh, important figures leaders um, from the family of Muhammad in the generations after the death of Muhammad when the community was riven by political and power struggles um, uh, that members of the family uh, who rose up uh, to um, contest uh, leadership of the early Muslim empire were, uh, um, you know, murdered or, and, and killed. And their martyrdom is a very important uh, part of Shi'i devotional and religious culture. His way of thinking through that was to really understand these key charismatic early figures as standing for social justice and fighting against oppression. And so he read the this kind of earlier sacred history for Shi'is through the lens of anti-colonial, anti-imperial, anti-oppression, social justice movements. Um, and he's, as I said, was, you know, somebody who was very influential um you know, in making some kind of relationship between the secular Marxist kind of analysis and anti-imperial, leftist anti-imperial politics and grounding them in, um, you know, Islam. Like his idea was that truly, um, you know, uh, implementing um, an understanding of Islam would uh, bring out, bring about, you um, you know, the classless society and a real society of justice. So he was somebody who was very interesting, you know, in trying to reconcile uh, socialism and Marxism. Um, but, you know, the reason why he thought you needed Islam in this context is that he didn't think that um, Marxism on its own um, could really motivate or provide the global South with the ideological means for liberation because they had a different cultural and historical formation and that um, Marxism on its own understood narrowly. And of course, he's somebody who's writing and thinking, you know, in the 50s and 60s when there were different phases of, of you know, kind of Marxist movements that they didn't take into account some of the emotional and spiritual and historical components of non-Western societies. And so what he was really trying to do was develop a form of Islam and a form of socialism that could meet the particular needs of uh, the Middle East and the Islamic world uh, to bring about what he thought would be a, a just society by uh, re really fundamentally reinterpreting and understanding Islam as a method of achieving um, social justice. So I think of... of these two as kind of important but very different kinds of uh, figures um, because I think Shariati had some kind of a critique of, of, of Marxism, even though it's clear that he absorbs so much in terms of analysis about economy and society from this kind of leftist, uh, critical, anti-capitalist uh, and anti-imperialist tradition. Um, but he really wanted to infuse and build these uh, 
Islamic concepts with a capacity uh, to apply them for social and political reform in the societies uh, where it was present already, the sort of a kind of revival and reform of Islam through a kind of Marxist uh, analysis of them. Mm. Yeah, that's so fascinating. There's so much history there. And of course, we're, we're merely scratching the surface. I mean, we could spend multiple hours just, just discussing that. I did wonder, though, before we move on a little bit, if you could touch on a little bit of, of Marxism's influence in the Palestinian struggle in particular. This is something that I know a little bit about. We've done an episode um, on Palestinian resistance that people can check out. It was in our Best Of series as well, where definitely some of this stuff is, is touched on. But I was wondering if maybe you could just kind of briefly um, articulate some of the intersections there. Well, um, I think, um, you know, that... Uh... There's a long kind of history and tradition um, within the Palestine liberation cause of Marxist uh, thought and thinkers, and some of the most radical programs for resistance have come, you know, particularly in the late 60s and through the 70s and early 80s, you know, from uh, Marxist-oriented uh, um, uh, uh traditions and organizations. So you have like the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine and, um, you know, key figures who founded it like George Habaj. Um, and they have always been really the vanguard in some ways of uh, the the movement for national liberation in those, in those eras. Um, I mean, we could go into a lot of their history, but they were definitely a revolutionary Marxist-Leninist uh, oriented uh, strand of resistance that were affiliated within the Palestine Liberation Organization, which was a broader umbrella organization that included Fatah, you know, and um, other kind of factions and groups. But um, really, I mean, maybe I'm biased, but I tend to think that the um, real political agenda and and drive that um led the led the Palestine liberation cause during the the late 60s and 70s really came out of the PFLP um you know and George uh Habash and the you know kind of some of the most famous activists um people like Leila Khaled right mm -hmm. um you know were affiliated with this particular organization and they were really uncompromising in their stands against Western imperialism and, um, you know, people like Hassan Kanafani, probably the most important um, Palestinian writer uh, of this uh, era, were affiliated with the PFLP faction. So I don't think really if you're looking at the history of the cause of, uh, you know, libera liberation in Palestine, um that really it can't be written without paying an awful lot of attention to um, the importance of Marxist and socialist, um, you know, uh, fighters for for liberation. They're really the core in that earlier period. That in the eighties to nineties, um, things started to shift. Um, you know, they they continue to to be active. Um, well, you have the emergence in that period of uh, alternate um, organizations that were more religiously oriented and religiously based, like Hamas and Islamic Jihad and so on. And it's true that in the earliest period um, that there seems to have been a tactical and strategic support in some ways by Israel, just like the United States was supporting you know, extreme um, religious organizations in, um, you know, the proxy war in Afghanistan mm -hmm. and around the world as an ant, uh, you know, as an alternative to communist parties and socialist parties, uh, some of which were incredibly strong and, and significant through the Middle East. So if you think of the Tudé party uh, that had, I can't remember the estimates, but, you know, maybe a million members in Iran in the 19. 50s and 60s um, before its suppression, you know, under the Shah, um, you know, in places like Indonesia, you know, where the Communist Party was hugely important and influential. But again, uh, the United States supported, um, 
you know, the repression of leftist movements. It also was really keen on supporting religious organizations as an antidote and as a rival. And that happened also in Palestine with Hamas uh, and Islamic Jihad, um, you know, being, um, you know, encouraged. I don't know. I wouldn't want to say that they were invented or not at all. I mean, they're, they're in, you know, they, they have their roots in, uh, you know, in the Palestinian community, of course. However, they were sometimes allowed to become stronger, what, you know, as a way to um, restrict um, the PFLP and some of the other more radical Marxist and socialist strands of resistance um, in the Palestinian liberation movement. Mm. Yeah. That's that's wonderful. Well, I, I do want to be sort of conscious of, of time here, and this was only meant to just be a little sort of sort of short introduction. Me and you have many things planned um, in the future, so we can revisit this topic. I mean, I want to have you on to talk about the Crusading Society and all of your work around that. We've talked for a while about doing episodes on Rumi, one of the famous Islamic mystics um, of, of Islamic history. We could even do an, an intro to Islam episode at some point. I would remind uh, listeners in general, if you like hearing discussions between me and Adnan, you could also always always join the Guerrilla History Patreon, in which we really kind of let our hair down and have conversations like this fairly often, especially on the Patreon when we don't have guests. Um, so I did want to get a chance to plug that. But as a sort of final question, just, just capping up this, this little discussion we've had so far, um, you know, one question I, I would have is, we talked about the Islamic foundations from which somebody with progressive or Marxist-minded commitments could use a lot of the stuff within the Islamic tradition to make sense of a political and social struggle. Um, but I was wondering what your thoughts are on what possibly Marxism might be able to offer Islam. I know you've talked about these movements historically, and what it seemed to have offered is an anti-imperialist analysis, the decolonial movement across the world cannot be separated um, from Marxism wholly. Um, Franz Fanon working within that tradition, um, sort of, you know, the decolonization as well as Marxism, drawing from Marxism to make sense of decolonial struggles, etc., um, but just uh, just kind of zooming out a little bit, what do you think Marxism might be offer or might be able to offer um, um, Islam going forward? Well, you know, in one way, I think um, Marxism gives greater clarity on what I would consider the important and significant and relevant dimensions of Muslim doctrine and practice? Like, what does Islam mean to people in the modern world? I mean, this has been a contested kind of category. I've alluded to some of these religious reform movements, the rise of new fundamentalist, or, you know, maybe we'd call far right, you know, Muslim movements that have taken that have taken place. And that is because it is a contested category. Religion is always a dynamic, uh, you know, uh, cultural experience and religion, you know, religion is not static, even though, of course, it's always uh, resting its authority on the past scripture, uh, um, you know, but every generation reinterprets these religion and r religious practices and ideas for themselves to make them relevant, even if there is a kind of core ethical um, set of commitments, these have to be recharged through uh, engagement with one's own world, one's own life. It has to be made relevant. And I feel like the anti-capitalist critique um, of Marxist uh, thought and theories of, of history, the yeah. idea of, of how history unfolds through dialectical materialism is absolutely vital um, for understanding how and why some of these ethical Kind of commitments and you know broader ideals of egalitarianism, about you know uh, confronting oppression, about uh, justice, how they should be interpreted for Muslims. Uh, it seems to me that uh, you have to really encompass um, what is the real evil of this uh, of this um, era. And also, you could it can even inform theological analysis in some ways because, you know, the, I mentioned the idea of the oneness of God, Tawhid, um, and not associating partners uh, to God's power as a kind of key theological theme 
you know, Islam was uh, revealed in the context of an idolatrous, polytheistic uh, religious culture of the tribal Arabs. And, you know, so this key theme was to mark a distinction between, you know, this new form of monotheistic religion versus uh, idolatry. And I think in some ways, capitalism and consumer culture um, can be understood very powerfully and evocatively for Muslims as a form of idolatry, as a form of, you know, uh, distraction from the true ethics of social solidarity and of, uh, of justice. Um, and that that comes into clear relief when you study and understand capitalism through, uh, you know, communist analysis, Marxist analysis. That can inform, I think, a real understanding of the deep roots of the, you know, ethics of uh, and, and principles of, of Islam. So that's what it has really, in some ways, um, to contribute is to... Um, is to allow us, allow Muslims to see um, in clearer ways uh, where oppression actually exists in our world today. Like if there's an ideal of standing up for justice and combating oppression, um, you have to understand what are the unique features and characteristics of oppression and the way it operates in our world today. That's just an absolute requirement. And I think Marxism is the best uh, way of trying to identify how that oppression is working in our world. Mm. Beautifully said, as always. Adnan, thank you so much for carving out some time to come on the show and discuss this with me. This is something I'm very interested in, and I know you and I will have many more conversations on this topic going forward. As always, I really do learn so much from you every time we talk. Um, it's like a, it's a personal little class with, with uh, Professor Adnan that I get to take. So I, really... oh, I, I always benefit so much. I really enjoyed the conversation and dialogue, and um it just, you know, helps me think about these important issues so much to have an interlocutor like you in a space on, on Rev Left Radio for these things, as well as guerrilla history. And so thank you for inviting me. I hope we will have more discussions like this in the near future. Definitely. Can you let listeners know where they can find you and your work online? Yeah, um, you can uh, go to my website, which is adnanhussein.org, um, and uh, follow me on Twitter. Uh, at Adnan A. Hussein, H-U-S-A-I-N. You can follow uh, and listen to uh, my other podcast, uh, The Muchless, M-A-J-L-I-S. You can find that. It's anchor.fm slash the dash muchless, M-A-J-L-I-S. And, uh, you know, also check out Guerrilla History if you haven't already. Absolutely.